the programme launched, which is great to see, especially given the year that was in it with 2020 and COVID. And a lot of the engagement we would do in the programme would be out meeting people face to face. And a lot of that had to obviously move to, to being done virtually. Um, so it was great. And it was a real testament to our mentors as well in terms of engaging with new groups and recruiting more to the network. And in terms of the climate action plan with our targets out to 2030, we sort of have set a target of at least getting at least 100 new SECs every year into the network where possible. And over the past three years, we've actually exceeded that. So it's great. It's really great to be seeing that that level of engagement. So communities essentially can join the network by filling out a registration form. It's online on our website. It's fairly straightforward. And that form helps us to capture the key areas of interest of the community and how we can best provide support to them um, through ourselves and also through our mentors. Just looking at the structure of how that, that all works within SEI, obviously the, the SEC team, there's three of us. So that's myself, my colleague, Julie Farley, and then uh, Ruth Buggy, who's the program manager, who some of you may have, have met before. Um, we have a new mentorship structure in place since the beginning of 2020. So it's actually four times bigger than it was previously. And that's largely due to the, the growth of the network um, up to now and obviously planned for the future as well. So the contract's in place for up to four years. And what we did was we split the country into four different regions. So we have a regional coordinator that manages each of those regions. And then below that, they also manage um, the county level mentors within their regions as well. So we have a mentor designated for each local authority region so we have over 30 in total but for most regions or most counties we have more than one county mentor per county and they split the time between themselves to support the growing number of SECs within the network and also just to mention here as well with alongside our regional coordinators we also have a national panel of mentors that can provide support to the SEC program more widely. So they can provide a variety of different types of supports and the panel members would be appointed on an as needed basis. So if there's a piece of work that comes up that's got more of a national remit, we can call on the support of the national panel to support that. Then looking at the plan stage, as I mentioned, this is where SECs can undertake an energy master plan. So they can apply to us for 100% funding of up to 25,000 euro. And the level of funding would depend on the size and the scale of the SEC. But that funding can go towards procuring the professional services of a consultant to help them to actually deliver, develop and deliver the energy master plan for the community. And they would, would be working in collaboration with the community to deliver that because it really is a... Um, as it says, they're a community led review of the community's energy use and consumption. So that would involve um, carrying out, you know, a desktop study and carrying out energy audits across the community and BERs and various surveys to assess what the energy baseline is. And then from there to map out what we call a register of opportunities, which essentially looks at the various different viable projects that the community can look to deliver. And it ranks them essentially in terms of what's most viable and what's going to give the best payback as well. And that sets out an action plan for the community. And throughout every stage of this, a community engagement is a very focal and important point, important part of this. There is flexibility around the focus of the energy master plan as well, and that can be built into the application when applying for, to us for funding and your mentor can support you with developing that application. But you can essentially tailor how you would like um, the energy master plan to be developed and what you would like the outputs of that to be. The due stage then is where, as I mentioned earlier on, where communities can look to access grants or supports through various different support programs to help them to deliver the projects in their communities. So most of our SECs would look towards the Community Energy Grant Program, which was previously called the Better Energy Communities Program, which some of you may have heard of before. Um, essentially, this program provides supports for new approaches to achieving energy efficiency across Irish communities. And for 2021, the budget um, in terms of funding for this program was 28 million. As far as I'm aware, it's actually still open at the moment for applications. It's an open call and the funding is provided on a first come first serve basis until it's fully allocated. And there is a really handy funding tracker on our website as well, which shows how much of the budget is still remaining. But the main aim of this particular scheme is to deliver energy savings for communities um, and private sector organizations and homeowners as well. And then at the end of 2020 and or the beginning of, of this year, we also launched a separate national home retrofit scheme. So this is separate to the community energy grant, but it provides grants for, as you can see there, the likes of one stop shops and housing associations and local authorities to deliver energy efficiency upgrades specifically for domestic buildings. 
so the funding for this um, particular scheme was 10 million and it was split up um, 8 million for standard applications from anywhere across the country and then 2 million was ring fenced for projects from the Midlands region. So my understanding is that includes applications from Galway, Kildare, Leash, Longford, Offaly, um, Tipperary, Roscommon and Westmeath. And again, that's an open funding call and there's a funding tracker on the website for this one as well. So the SEC team, we are actually in the process of developing a new pilot uh, grant program as well, the, the title of which is still to be finalised, but at the moment we're calling it the Local Energy Action Fund, which would give us a nice acronym of LEAF. Um, so the aim of this particular new grant would be to empower communities to improve their energy use locally, and it would provide a new funding stream specifically for community led projects, and it would sit within the overall national retrofit agenda, so it would support getting homes up to a B2 level or above, and also to significantly improve the energy efficiency of community buildings. Um, as well as the option of delivering national or sorry not national novel um, innovation uh, or demonstration projects so essentially there is likely to be two strands within this fund the first one being um your sort of off the shelf funding package looking at essentially kind of like a menu of different um energy efficiency upgrade measures that the applicant can select and build it into a, a package or the second stream will be for the novel innovative demonstration projects which will give a bit more flexibility in terms of the types of projects um, and and how they're to be delivered there so it's expected that this fund will launch at the very end of q2 of this year so probably the end of june all going to plan the funding levels for this is a slightly smaller scale grant for communities, so it's up to 220,000 per project, and it's available for SEC network members or local authorities that are applying on behalf of an SEC. And if anyone wants more information specifically on this pilot, uh, you can contact my colleague Julie Farrelly, she's the one who's uh, working on the design and development of this pilot at the moment. Just looking back then at the Community Energy Grant uh, in terms of the impacts to date from this program. So this has been, this program has been running since about 2014 or 15. And over that course of time, it's supported around 430 community energy efficiency projects across the country, which has upgraded 19,000 homes and around 2,900 community, public and or private buildings as well. That has um, been an investment of 160 million in grants to support these projects. And it's also supported leveraging around 400 million of overall investment across these projects. And through the delivery of um, the various projects, there's been an estimated annual energy saving of around 70 million. So I just shared the link there as well for um, our case study booklet. You can see the screenshot of the, the front cover of it there on the right hand side. But it's really useful um, if anyone wants to go onto our website and have a look at it because it talks through a number of different projects that have been supported through the grant program and um, how the projects worked and the funding that was received and the achievements um, from those projects. So I'd encourage anyone to go have a look at that. On our website as well, we also have a section that's dedicated to community success stories. So this showcases a number of our SECs in terms of projects and achievements that they've, they've um, gone through to date. So some of which will have gone through the Community Energy Grant Programme and some of which it'll talk about their energy master plans or their aims and ambitions. So that's a really useful section of our website if anyone wants to find out a bit more about some of our groups. So that was um, the first part there, the first section around the Sustainable Energy Community Programme. And now I just wanted to move on to talk a little bit about communities and renewables specifically in relation to the Renewable Electricity Support Scheme or RES. So hopefully um, a number of you have heard about this scheme. Essentially, it's our, the Irish uh, government's new scheme to support the development of renewable electricity projects in Ireland. So the main aim of RES is to enable Ireland to meet its target of 70% renewable electricity by 2030 and also the EU wide target of 32% by 2030 as well. And RES is based on an auction system, which essentially means that's where renewable generators compete against each other for contracts by bidding in a price for the power that they can provide and the, the price at which they can provide it for. So this has been done elsewhere within the EU. It is a relatively new development within the Irish energy market, but the auction system itself helps to deliver lower prices or set a guaranteed price over a set period of time as well. And RES contracts for successful projects through the auctions will typically apply for about a 15 year period within 
um, res, there's been a number of community aspects that have been built into the fabric of the scheme. And they're specifically around enabling communities to be able to participate in the generation of renewable electricity in their local areas and to support the transition of Ireland to a low carbon economy. So looking at those aspects, those community aspects, there's kind of four key areas. The first one there being the community pot in the auction. So within the res auctions, there is a, um, a community pot or category, which essentially is ring fenced for community led projects. So that would be projects that would be between 0 0.5 and 5 megawatts in scale. And for the first res auction, which happened in the middle of 2020, community led meant projects that were majority owned by the community. So they had to be at least 51% owned by the community entity, and then the other 49% could be made up of a developer. Um, a number of you may have heard that earlier this month, the Minister made an announcement that going forward for future res auctions, community led projects would now need to be 100% owned by the community. So that, that kind of shift change there, I think part of the rationale for that was the fact that the portion of the auction, which is ring fenced for community projects, is only a very small portion of the overall auction. So it's only about up to 2% of the, the full auction and the rest being for developer led projects. So the feeling there was that because it is such a small um, proportion that the projects going through it through the community category should really be fully community owned. Uh, another aspect then of the community aspects of RES is the community enabling framework, and I'll touch on this in a bit more detail in a moment, but essentially that will provide access for communities to a range of different supports and resources, all to support project development and delivery. The community benefit funds is another aspect, so all successful RES projects, it will be mandatory for them to offer a community benefit fund of two euro per megawatt hour to the local communities within the vicinity of their projects, and they'll have to offer that on an annual basis over the lifetime of the project. The final one there is the community and citizen investment scheme. So a high level investment scheme was designed before the first res auction, but it wasn't finalized and really ready to be in place for the first auction. So at the time it was sort of shelved. It's now coming back off the shelf and being revisited to see how an investment scheme could be designed and developed um, to provide opportunities for citizens and communities to be able to actually invest in projects within their locality or potentially also on a regional basis or even nationally as well. So that's one to kind of keep an eye out for. Just coming onto the community enabling framework in a little bit more detail. Um, so SAAI have been made the implementation body for this framework, meaning that we will be responsible for putting the various different supports and resources in place. So as you can see here, there's four key areas within this framework. The first one there being the trusted intermediary role. So this is a role that's going to be recruited in-house within SEAI, and they'll build out a support service from there. Um, we're hoping that role will go out fairly soon and we'll have someone in the next couple of months in place. But essentially, this person will be the first point of contact for communities that are interested in res or have potential projects in the pipeline and they're looking for some support. We'll also need to procure a panel of trusted advisors. So these advisors will essentially provide free and impartial expert advice and support across a number of different areas. It'll mainly focus around technical and legal and financial support, and that will include things like the grid connection process and planning permission support as well, but also things like project management and community engagement. Financial supports will be another element, and that will largely focus around creating enabling grants, and that will support things like project scoping and early development works and costs. There's also talk of having soft development loans for communities. So when we talk about soft development loans, that just means that if a community were to get a loan and then progress through the development of the project, and for whatever reason, it turned out that the project was not no longer going to be viable to proceed any further, the loan could be written off and converted to a grant. The final piece there is the creation of an online information warehouse. So that essentially will be a website where communities can go to get all of the information that they need about res, the community aspects of the scheme and the various opportunities and supports available to them. There'll be resources and tools and case studies and things like that as well. And we are also going to be developing a guidance toolkit, which essentially will provide a suite of different guidance modules across a number of different projects 
development and technology areas. So if any of you are aware of the CARES programme in Scotland, which is the Community and Renewable Energy Scheme, that particular programme was looked at in a good bit of detail when it came to designing some of the community aspects of RES. And they've developed what they call a CARES toolkit. And essentially it provides something quite similar in terms of the guidance modules across a number of different areas. And we've got an agreement from the Scottish government who are the owners of that toolkit to essentially utilize some of those resources as a baseline and adapt them and convert them into the Irish context for Ireland. So it's great to have that kind of partnership working across Scotland and Ireland and being able to essentially not reinvent the wheel, but to utilize some existing resources that are already in place and are well established and have been fairly successful to date and uh, adapt them for Ireland. And just to say that all of these elements within the framework are currently in design and development. So they're not currently in place, but we're hoping to get a lot of them up and running over the course of this year. Um, Okay, so I think this is one of my final slides, but I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the community benefit funds as well. So as I mentioned, um, all projects will have to provide a community benefit fund of two euro per megawatt hour to the local communities in the area of the project. How the funds are to be divided up is to be the same across all projects. So this division of funding is built into the RES terms and conditions and also into the community benefit fund best practice guidelines, which we are supporting the department to develop at the moment. So those guidelines essentially will provide recommendations on how best to administer um, and uh, to establish and administer community benefit funds. Um, they will likely, those guidelines will go out for consultation, hopefully fairly shortly, and then they'll need to be finalized and published by June of this year. So looking at the division of funding, then the first one there is near neighbor payments. So this top one only applies for to onshore wind projects. It doesn't apply to solar. The other three areas though will apply to all projects regardless of technology. So the near neighbor payments will mean that wind farm developers will need to offer a payment of at least 1000 euro per year to the near neighbors living within one kilometer of the project site. Now it can be more than a thousand euro and that can be through negotiation with the developer and the near neighbor, but the guidelines are gonna suggest that the overall near neighbor payments that are paid out per project shouldn't exceed kind of 25 to 30% of the overall fund. Then a minimum of 40% of the fund should go towards supporting projects in the community that align with sustainable development goal initiatives. So projects, mainly looking at things like education, energy efficiency, sustainable energy or climate action. Then a maximum of 10% of the fund should go towards the administration costs associated with actually administering the fund itself. So ensuring that there's good governance in place and that there's successful outcomes from the fund as well. And then whatever balance is remaining within the fund should go towards supporting local clubs or societies or any other not-for-profit entities within the community. So, these community benefit funds are going to be very substantial over the lifetime of all of these projects and over the, the lifetime of RES as well, because with every new auction, there's going to be more successful projects, each of which are going to have to set up a community benefit fund. So it's estimated that within the first year of community benefit funds, you could be looking at about 4 million that's going into Irish communities across the country. And there's a target there. You can see the pop out on the left hand side that by 2030, there's a target to reach 30 terawatt hours of renewable electricity generation. And if that is reached, you could be looking at around 60 million going into Irish communities. So it will have really substantial impacts for projects, for communities and supporting various local projects. And in terms of our wider role with the, in the community benefit funds, obviously I mentioned we're working with the department on developing the guidelines, but we also have to set up and manage an online community benefit fund register. So that will be an online portal where project developers that are successful through RES will have to register the details of their projects. And then when they set up their community benefit funds, they'll have to register the details of the funds um, on that register as well. And then they'll have to carry out annual reporting on the community benefit fund, the projects that are being supported and the impacts that are being felt across the communities. And we will have an oversight and compliance role in relation to that. And also ensuring that there's fairly frequent reviews taking place of the funds over time as well to ensure that over the lifetime of a project, that they're remaining relevant and fit for purpose for a community and that they're creating that kind of lasting legacy within a community as well as things change over time. So there's a lot going on with RES um, and it'll be a, a busy a busy couple of years getting a lot of the supports up and running and in place. Finally then I just wanted to mention that the, the RES auction that I said earlier on happened in the middle of 2020. So um, there was 82 projects that were successful through the first auction 
63 of them were solar and 19 were onshore wind. But within that, there were seven successful community led projects. Five of them were solar and two were onshore wind. Now, two were fully uh, community led, so they were 100% owned by the community, and five of them were shared ownership projects. So they're progressing now through the, the res process. But as I mentioned earlier, the future res auctions will require community led projects to be 100% owned by the community. Um, and the second res auction, there isn't a set date for that yet, but it's expected to be um, the end of this year. And then finally, I think this is my last slide. I just wanted to touch on the grid connection process as well. So um, ECP2, um, ECP stands for the Enduring Connection Policy. And this is ESB Network's um, grid connection process for 2020 out to 2023. So within that, they have a simplified process for community-led projects, which is um, very welcome to see. But essentially, community-led projects don't have to have planning permission in advance of applying for their grid connection under this process. But if they do have their grid or their planning permission already, their application for grid connection will be prioritized. So successful projects through um, this grid connection process will essentially receive a connection assessment, which sets out their outline connection method and their cost. And then when they receive their planning permission and they pay the balance of the grid application fee, they'll then get their formal grid connection offer from ESB. So just to, to mention that when a, a community applies for grid connection with their application, they have to submit a 2000 euro deposit. I believe it used to be about 7000 and it was reduced into 2000, which is is more manageable. And that will get you, if you're successful through the process, the connection method and cost, which is a really valuable um, bit of information for any project to have. Then um, you have a two year period of which to get your planning permission and pay the balance of the grid application fee. And that fee will be determined based on the scale or the size of the project. So ECP2, as I mentioned, is running from 2020 out to 2023. There's three rounds over three years and new grid capacity is released once a year every September. But community projects can apply um, into ESB at any time. And this, just to mention, this is where we actually utilized our national panel of mentors as well to provide some support to communities. So we submitted um, or we sent out an expression of interest form across all of our network members to identify SECs that were interested in res and had any potential projects that were looking to apply for grid connection in 2020. So we had over 60 responses to the expression of interest in total and 20, around 20 SECs were looking to submit their grid application in 2020. So through our national panel, we provided support to get those, um, to assess the, the projects and get those grid applications in and over the line in September. Uh, and I believe C Community Power did something very similar as well and supported a number of projects to get their grid applications in in time. Um, so that was sort of a, an interim support measure from our side with our national, pa um, national panel in place of having the enabling framework set up and in place. Um, just to, that screenshot on the right there as well just shows um, ESB's new community guide in relation to connecting a community project to the grid. They published that in December and it's a really useful guide. I'd recommend anyone having a look at it. It talks step by step through the grid application process and then also the grid connection process. So it's a really useful um, document for communities. And ESB have actually also um, put in place a new community liaison team within ESB to support community-led projects. So it really comes back again to that recognition of the importance of communities in our energy transition. So it's it's another very welcome, um, welcome sign to see. So that was it for me. I know it was, it was quite a lot in a short space of time, but if anyone has any questions, um, I'm happy to, to try to answer those. And my contact details are there. Or if anyone has specific queries around the SEC program or community res, there's dedicated mailboxes for that as well. So that's it for me. Uh, and I'll Quiva. pass back to Anna. Very good. Thank you, Quiva. I'm sure we've all taken some very useful information from your, your presentation there. And I can see the chat facility is uh, very busy oh, uh, in terms of uh, different uh, opinions and questions. Uh, and just to let everyone know that yes, the presentations will be available afterwards um, and we can perhaps distribute them. We also have a, a new Handy Heat YouTube uh, channel established so we can be playing some of the presentations over on that as well. Um, there's been some uh, questions about actually the definition of uh, what is a community and I see Yoon Ramsey is joining us today so I'd like to welcome Yoon because 
Um, you mentioned as well, Quiva, the whole Scottish Irish modeling mm -hmm. uh, there as well. And I know that um, even when we're discussing the definition of a community, we did spend a lot of time in the last NPA project that I was involved with called Recent and how to define a community. Yeah. And the definition, uh, the Irish definition in comparison to the Scottish definition, indeed in the Nordic countries as well. So um, I think for a project like Handy Heat, it'll be useful maybe to kind of generate some discussion as well. I know yeah. the SEI are looking at like the geographical communities and also uh, the communities of interest as well when mm -hmm. they're talking about their, their sustainable energy communities. And it's also very heartening as well to hear the words community and community empowerment being used so many times during your presentation as well in terms of uh, the community benefit fund and yes. uh, the whole empowerment about the, the grid connection as well. So I think there's plenty of food for thought there as well towards uh, the end of our uh, webinar. And also very interesting to hear about the, the, the smaller communities to give them a ch uh, an opportunity in terms of the local energy action fund as well. So that's yeah. a, a new aspect. It is. Yeah. I certainly haven't heard of uh, before in the past. Mm -hmm. And I suppose we've just to congratulate you and your team as well, because I've been working with SEI now for the last number of years. And I remember when there was only, I think, 12 registered fees <laughs> with uh, yeah. SEI. And here now there's over 500. Um, it's fantastic. So congratulations yeah. to you. Oh, and thank you very much. You. Ruth, um, on, on the whole aspect of community and uh, promoting uh, the, the, the concept of community empowerment as well. Yeah, and a big thank you to our mentors as well for all the, the work that they do on the ground with the communities because they're out really, you know, on the ground with the communities and supporting them day to day. So um, they've done a, a huge amount of work in terms of engaging with the communities and getting new members on board as well. So big thank you to them as well. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you, Quiva. And indeed, um, Quiva's presentation leads on very nicely to our next speaker, which is actually uh, myself, uh, in terms of the aspects of community empowerment. So I just like to share my screen with you there. I think that's okay. Everyone is can see my screen there, I hope. Yep. Yes. That's great. Okay, so thank you, Quiva, for that presentation. And as I said in my introduction, um, again, my name is Alma Gallagher, and I work for a community-based voluntary housing association called CLOR ICH, Camaris Irish Centre Housing. And we're the only voluntary housing association in Ireland delivering retrofitting projects um, on behalf of Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. So we operate in that uh, space, if you like, as a social enterprise, because we are, are a social enterprise ourselves, as well as addressing uh, fuel poverty uh, here in Ireland. And uh, Quiva mentioned in her presentation there about mentoring and how there's nominated mentors in each of the counties. We're actually a nominated mentor in County Roscommon. And also we're affiliated uh, with Mel Gavin as well, who is the regional coordinator in Sligo IT. So we would be on board with a lot of the mentoring and creating sustainable energy communities here uh, in Connacht. Uh, Quiva also mentioned in her presentation as well, uh, the Better Energy Communities Fund. And we in Clore, um, as a voluntary housing association, I suppose we, not, we don't only just build houses, we create sustainable communities as well. And, and as part of that, we're very much involved with the Better Energy Communities Programme. So um, I'm delighted to be able to present uh, some of the workings of our organisation here in Clore ICH with you. So where I suppose uh, Quiva's perspective and SD, SEI's perspective is at a national level, where I'm coming from at the moment is from a, a local level and in terms of how we help other rural communities come on board and help them to access uh, the many grants that are available from, from Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland and how we offer this wraparound service, if you like, this one-stop shop uh, in terms of getting the information out there to rural communities and helping them with their applications to Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. Sorry, I'm just trying to move on to the next slide. Apologies, I think my there is. Okay. 
Okay, I think we're okay now. So uh, my presentation, um, I'll introduce you to Chlor ICH and uh, the services that we deliver here as a voluntary housing uh, organization. And also um, I'll expand a bit on Quiba's uh, policy review and bring it down maybe more so to a local level. Also, I will look at the role of Chloride mm -hmm. in creating sustainable energy communities. And I've done this in two, from two perspectives. Firstly, uh, looking at the whole uh, pre-development and capacity building supporting communities, and also looking then at the practical support. So how we actually form our applications and offer that whole concept of a one-stop shop facilities to rural communities. We'll also have a look as well at a case study, um, a sustainable energy community that we have supported here in Plor ICH called Polcat, located in County Roscommon. And Polcat is the first community-based uh, commu uh, water facility that uh, looks at their treatment plant and sources uh, energy from a re renewable energy source. So that's a very interesting project um, and it's like a flagship project uh, for uh, the country. And in conclusion, um, I'm just going to look at some of the engagement tools. Um, how do we get our message out there? How do we get out into rural communities, instill the trust um, and handhold and to develop sustainable energy communities um, in the regions that we work with? So firstly, um, who are Chlor ICH? Well, we're a voluntary housing association and we were established in 2000. And initially our role was very much to build social and sheltered housing for people most in need in our communities. And indeed we have um, very much looked at independent living and also sheltered housing as well. So we have various developments that we have secured funding from the Department uh, of Environment and we continue to maintain and offer social services to the residents. Our role has very much evolved since uh, 2000. And um, so we not only build houses, but our whole ethos is to create sustainable communities with all of the different services that uh, we deliver. And in 2006, our journey started uh, in terms of the whole concept of energy efficiency and promoting that whole concept of addressing fuel poverty, where SEAI and the Department of Social Protection they saw a gap there in the targeting of their programs. And I suppose this was the whole beginning of the movement towards community and the importance and if you like the realization of the role that community has to play in energy conservation, where they felt that organizations like ourselves who work on the ground already worked with stakeholders that were um, working with fuel poor domestic householders and they felt by working with organizations like ourselves, that they could target um, more, more targeting in terms of identifying those most in need of um, uh, energy conservation measures. So that's when our journey began with SCI in terms of delivering energy retrofitting measures. So again, sometimes I think we need to really focus as well of when we're creating sustainable energy communities, the value that these retrofitting um, opportunities have to a community, it's not only uh, looking at fuel poverty and domestic householders, but we also create very sustainable employment opportunities as well. So there's a value added there to a small community like Clemaris and indeed to County Mayo as well, where materials are actually purchased locally, where employment um, is being created, uh, where uh, people that would be normally on the live register perhaps are, are retrained up by organizations like Chlor ICH because we're not from the private sector. We operate very much in the third sector uh, in that social enterprise sector. So we would have labor market schemes uh, available to us. So we have the ability to train up those that perhaps would be far removed from the labor market and offer them a quality employment opportunity um, in the whole retrofitting scene. As well as that, um, because of the fact that we have housing stock, we are able to look 
at raising awareness of energy efficiency. So we would have housing stock there that would be able to model and to demonstrate renewable energy technologies that perhaps there might be a fear factor there um, to, to local people that they don't want to be the, if you like, the guinea pigs or the, the first one to adopt a, a new uh, principle or a new technology um, into their homes. So we're very much open to that here in Clory CH to have our housing stock uh, used as a demonstration uh, project. So we invite all of the community to come along to view it to sense it to use it and to really know um you know how how, how such a technology works and also we pr uh, very much pr uh, promote the principles of environmental practices as well uh, in terms of, again we're, we're not only um, a retrofitting company we actually marry that with a whole range of different social services as well so we look at, at a community in a holistic uh, approach um, we have the Law and Social Housing Scheme where we have 25 units of housing there looking at independent living for older people. We also um, have a community garden as well called Growing Locally. And when we hosted our Handy Heat uh, partnership programme back uh, two years ago now, last May, it's hard to believe, but we brought our partners over to see the, the community garden as well. Um, we constructed and managed a, a 5.2 million a sheltered housing project in Mayfield Lake Development, all looking at high energy efficiency, solar panels, etc. Um, and we're very proud of that flagship project. We also uh, work with Rural Regeneration Programme as well, where we purchase, uh, renovate and retrofit and um, rural, rural houses as well to people most in need or people relocating for urban centres. We have a care and repair program too, where we have a man in a van that uh, goes out into the homes of older people or people living alone, um, offering minor repairs as well, uh, where perhaps they wouldn't or wouldn't be sustainable for a handyman to go out and do those um, uh, small renovations. We look at the whole idea from fuel poverty to food poverty. So we have a food cloud initiative there as well, where we have a community shop and we would take the surplus of food from multinationals such as, as Tesco, Aldi, indeed our own super value here. And we would deliver uh, though, that surplus food, which is uh, very important too, is especially in these COVID times. Um, and I know there's a strong, um, strong similarities between ourselves here in Clore and our Kelsey Living Centre as well, uh, another Handy Heat partner. Um, we've been partnering in European projects um, in the last few years. Um, and again, our, our Mayfield Lake development has been very much, um, we've been strategically located there that we've been able to, if you like, gain those opportunities in terms of different um, uh, materials that we have used in our development that are able to showcase the community. And also we manage um, deep retrofit energy upgrades, which Quiba has mentioned there in terms of the better energy communities, uh, in terms of the housing retrofit grant that has been launched this year, uh, and as well as that, the, the Better Energy Warmer Home Scheme, where we target uh, fuel poor households. And, and we have been delivering those initiatives since 2006. I've given you, looking at, at some of the, the pictures there from our developments, uh, you'll see the solar panels. Um, we have actually a, a training centre as well in the community building. Where we're able to offer uh, training facilities uh, to the local community. Um, and again, it's kind of like a safe environment and a, a very high um, conservation unit um, that we're able to offer our residents in, in Mayfield Lake development. So there's actually 36 units there that are built um, there in Mayfield Lake development. I'm going to, if, if you like, expand a little bit now and just explain as a voluntary housing association where we work and, 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 and the place that we are at now in terms of uh, delivering renewable energy uh, initiatives. We are a social enterprise first and foremost, and we are a community development organization. Um, we ourselves help to empower other community development organizations and help them achieve their own, uh, their own objectives. Um, and as a social enterprise, we're very much uh, carved uh, by the national social enterprise policy, where businesses whose core objective is to achieve a social, societal and environmental impact. So any surplus that we would uh, gain in terms of 
um, the houses that we would build, the energy retrofitting programs that we would deliver, any dividend that would be earned is reinvested back into the community again, which allows us, if you like, to pay our staff and um, allows us, if you like, to operate in that whole sphere of energy uh, retrofitting. We're not from the private sector. We don't have, if you like, an allegiance to any one particular um, product or service. So there's a trust element there with, with uh, rural communities um, because there's a, a social ethos attached uh, to us. So if you like, there's, there's, that, that's great for forming um, a trust relationship with the SME sector and the, the rural communities as well. Quiva also mentions the Climate Action Plan as well, and indeed it's a very ambitious plan, and one that is very exciting to us here in Chlor ICH because it provides a roadmap for us for the next, you know, for, for the next 20 years, if you like, in terms of securing our position within uh, the whole uh, energy retrofitting center, whole energy retrofitting scene. And indeed for Chlor ICH, um, we are the nominated men mentors, um, as I said, for County Roscommon. Um, we very much um, help other communities in terms of uh, creating sustainable energy communities. And we've, we're also on the framework as well for the next four years for targeting uh, uh, fuel poor domestic households. So just to give you a snapshot shot of the, the very ambitious targets that are there for um, 2020. For, so by 2030, 70% of all electricity generated will be in the form of renewable energy sources. So if you like, in terms of the grid connection and the whole reese that um, Quiva uh, mentioned there, that's very, very important and marries very much with the objectives that we have here in Chlor ICH. There's 950,000 electrical vehicles to be on the road as well. So again, it's very much underpinning sustainable energy communities. And we in Chlor ICH have noticed that there is, um, in terms of the EV charges as well, that's very much prominent in the better energy communities as well. We would look at working with Mayo County Council, Roscommon, Sligo County Council in terms of installing those um, EV chargers. There's 500,000 existing homes to be upgraded to a B2 certification. So again, a lot of money is going to be invested in the upgrading of houses. You know, we all know it's sometimes it's, it's a lot um, more economical to build a new house, but like to renovate an existing house up to such a high standard requires a lot of investment. And it's one that we are continuously speaking about within our Handy Heat project. The whole ethos of our Handy Heat project is looking at the whole rural dimension, the whole idea of, of fuel poverty within a rural area and to to. Um, to renovate and upgrade such a large volume of houses up to such a high standard requires such a significant investment and it's great to see that there is this investment outlined in the climate action plan for 2020 with the likes of the better energy communities and uh, the housing retrofit scheme as well so i hope organizations like ourselves will be very very busy over the coming years homeowners to generate their own electricity and sell back to the grid under the scheme for micro generation. Again, we have been uh, looking at the whole concept with SDI um, on storage battery, the installation of PV, et cetera. So that's very, very important to us as well in terms of putting these better energy community applications together. And also to get that message out there into the public. So when we, as mentors, go out into communities who are, who are interested in signing up to sustainable energy communities. Our role is not just to inform them of what our sustainable energy communities are, but also to explain the different funds, the different renewable energy technologies, and if you like to demystify the whole area of this renewable energy technologies, because what we find in rural areas is that while they have heard of these different um, aspects Sometimes a rural community may not know exactly what they mean or how to fund them. How do they work? Um, so if you like, we're, 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 we're peering it back a little from SAI's learn, plan and do. We're looking very much at the how in all of that. And again, heat pumps. Uh, I know that um, the Northern Ireland Executive have, have as part of their pilot within the Handy Heat Project looked at the installation of heat pumps and also here in Chlor ICH. Um, we have um, very much installed 
um, numerous heat pumps into uh, rural households. And again, 600,000 is a very, very ambitious number. And I think it requires um, a lot of education along the installation of heat pumps, not just in, in terms of if, like the plumbing aspect and the electrical aspects, but also from the householder's point of view as well, because we really very much have to look at fabric first. Uh, before we install these heat pumps. So there's a role there for Chlor-ICH in terms of education, um, educating the householder and indeed the community of what are the pros and cons, what needs to happen um, in terms of, uh, to the house, in terms of exterior insulation before the actual, the installation of a heat pump um, is installed. As I said, um, the role of Chlor-ICH. So I have looked at the role in terms of two perspectives. Firstly, in terms of pre-development and capacity building. And secondly, then in terms of the, the one-stop shop facility that we provide here in Chlor-ICH. Um, and the whole definition. So as I said uh, there previously, um, defining a community of interest or a geographical community is very, very difficult. And especially when we're talking to our Scandinavian partners as well, because their idea of community as well is very different to um, ours here on the island of Ireland. Um, so sustainable energy communities, I suppose, are community led initiatives where communities come together to become more sustainable, use less energy, use clean energy, and use smart energy as well. So how does this happen? And, and I suppose, what is the process that uh, Chlor ICH uh, embark on in terms of to make this journey happen for rural communities? Um, we very much advertise through word of mouth. Um, we've been delivering these retrofitting programs since 2006. So our name is out there. So we try and use the parish newsletters, word of mouth, radio, um, um, and also the power of Facebook as well, Twitter, social media. So um, communities come to us to say, look, at, we we're interested in uh, putting an application together. We have um, you know, natural resources available to us, wind, water. We're beside the coast in the Galefoot areas here in County Mayo. What do we do? How do we make this happen? We've heard of sustainable energy communities, but how do we go about this? We in Clore go out into rural communities and unfortunately, I suppose we haven't actually been physically out there since the whole aspect with, with COVID. We've been very much uh, busy with webinars like this and also um, online um, with rural communities as well. But we help them in terms of forming a committee. And sometimes, um, I suppose, here on, on the island of Ireland, especially in the Republic, so to access any funds, you have to have a legal, legal entity established. Um, it's not just about forming a committee anymore. You have to have election of officers. You have to have your memorandum and articles of association, et cetera. So we would very much help organizations and community development organizations um, go on that path, if you like, and provide that advice and guidance to rural communities. We would assess them with their, we would help them as well with their application to SEI to register, to help them register with Sustainable Energy Authority on becoming a sustainable energy community. We would host information workshops in communities as well. And oftentimes it's not just workshop, one workshop. We could be out there on numerous occasions um, where we would just talk to the committee first and then we would help them, um, you know, organize uh, their own workshop, help them get the word out in their own parishes and um, find out who the key people are, who are the key stakeholders within their community, invite them on board and if you like facilitate the workshop on their behalf. They are the, the face of the, of the uh, seminar etc. We, we would help them in terms of providing all of that background support to them to enable them to host uh, a, professional, uh, a professional workshop and meeting as possible. Um, also, I know that uh, Quiva mentions the energy master plan as well. We would help them create that energy master plan. Or if we're not the nominated mentor, they would be very much, um, you know, invited on board, such as in Tormakidi, invited on board there to launch their energy master plan. So as Quiva said, the energy master plan would identify different opportunities available to the community where perhaps they could um, maximize the resources available to them in terms of where they live or the geographical area where they live, or perhaps they have identified 
50 householders, maybe 20 are fuel poor, the others non-fuel poor. There could be a school there, there could be a GA club, etc. all of whom are in need of energy upgrades. So that, that is all identified in their energy master plan, but where do they go from there? What's the next, what's the next step in terms of once that energy master plan is established? I think the, 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 the the most disheartening thing that can happen is when a plan is produced and it's just left there on the shelf gathering dust. So where we come on board in Clore is that we would help make that action plan a reality. So we would identify um, what elements can be achievable in year one, what, what elements can be achieved in year two and year three, and put that roadmap in place and um, put an application together on behalf of the community and helping them uh, realize that action plan. So perhaps the school and the church and 20 households um, are a realistic option for year one. So we would help them if I put that application together. So as a social enterprise, we go out to the community, we provide surveying, uh, we would do the surveying, so we do a pre-survey, we would cost up all the different installations, uh, liaise with the community, liaise with the householders. We don't charge for going out into householders either. Do you know what I mean? This is something um, that we would avail of ourselves through different labour market schemes. And there's no onus on the community or on householders that they must uh, engage with a application to SEAI. So there's very much an, a mentoring element there as well and a learning curve. Perhaps if they decide not to go with it in year one, they may decide, you know, that they need time to think and then they would be in a better position maybe next year then to avail of a grant from SEAI. So we would very much handhold the community to realise their own different uh, objectives. So again, it's all about prioritizing opportunities and identifying the energy products uh, projects in the rural community. We would work with various stakeholders as well. Um, and again, Quiva mentioned in her presentation, the whole idea of finance, and there was a list of different innovative finance opportunities available. We in Clore, and when we were putting an application together, we would liaise with different stakeholders, but we would liaise as well with obligated parties um, who would purchase uh, energy credits. So for every installation that's installed in a, in a community, whether it's in a house, a commercial building or a community centre, there is an energy credit weighted on that installation. So um, energy companies, there's an, there's an obligation on energy companies to reduce their own uh, carbon footprint. So they would be in a position to purchase these energy credits. So we would barter on behalf of the community with different utility companies to purchase these energy credits. So um, it would reduce the cost down to the community as well. Uh, because, for example, for voluntary housing associations, um, if they want to avail of grants through the Better Energy Communities, it's up on 50%. However, we would up on 50%, but on evaluation of the, the project, oftentimes it could be at 45% uh, once we have the mix uh, in terms of the, the commercial sector, the voluntary sector, fuel poor and non-fuel poor. So the energy credits would go into the mix there as well. And it's another investment to reduce uh, the shortfall that voluntary housing associations or the community sector or domestic households have to make within that application. And finally, then in terms of the pre-development and the capacity building, we very much reach out to communities. We help them create their vision we help them achieve their vision and we empower them because as Quiva said um, in her presentation there, there's there's an onus now on smaller applications um, to SEI and I think this is a, a great opportunity um, for, uh, for smaller rural communities to dip their toes and to get to empower themselves to apply for uh, funding to SEI because it is very very daunting in terms of cash flow uh, when they're managing a 200 euro 200,000 uh, project on behalf of the community as well so it's helping them basically start off at a smaller scale and indeed that they'll have a support mechanism around them then in terms of upskilling and how to manage deliver um, and, and tick all the boxes and the requirements, the procurement requirements as well, that are bestowed upon the, the community group. Because 
we need to remember as well that when we're empowering communities and creating sustainable communities, a lot of our community leaders are doing this on a voluntary basis. They're not paid employees. They're not accountants. They're not, you know, we're very lucky if we're able to co-opt onto um, a community group, you know, accountants or uh, solicitors, etc. But um, we're not everything to everybody. So um, to be able to upskill and to share the skill base that we have is, is very, very important too. Um, in terms of moving away from the whole capacity building and pre-development in terms of the role that we would offer here in energy uh, retrofitting. We're a one-stop shop from application for funding um, to the energy uh, installations. We would offer a wraparound service. So even from, um, you know, looking at the fuel poor householders as well, it's amazing really, we've been delivering the, the fuel poor um, initiative since 2006. And a lot of our um, householders still do not realize what they're entitled to. So even in terms of the warmer home scheme, they're entitled to free attic and cavity wall insulation and ventilation services oh, under, sure. our, under our fuel poor initiative. Um, so no, there's a lack of yeah. realization there sometimes. Yeah. That yeah. Even though I, 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 was, I was doing it um, the also in terms of like a wraparound service as well. So we would go out to the communities, deliver um, the different advice and guidance. We would be instrumental uh, providing all of the energy surveys. We would provide all of the costings. We would put the application together. We would submit the application to SEI. We do all of the, the, the contact with SEI. Uh, once that application then is successful, we go back out into the rural community and also um, engage with different contractors as well and making sure um, that, you know what I mean, the, the service that they are providing is up to the standards and the technical specifications required by Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. And there's very much a rob robust uh, project planning process um, in play there as well, because once we are giving a pot of funds from SEAI, there's a start date and a finish date. So for example, with the housing retrofitting grant and the better energy communities, there's a starting point and an end point. So for example, um, we could have to deliver a million euros worth of uh, energy retrofits in a space of seven months. All of that needs to be quality controlled. Our contractors all need to be familiar and also um, very, very competent in terms of the, the specifications because we pay out our subcontractors first and it's only after uh, the inspections unit of SEI call out to inspect the works that we've delivered do we get paid ourselves. So there's comfort as well with communities knowing that they are receiving the highest quality of works possible because we are taking the risk in terms of um, uh, quality control, et cetera. Um, and we're also availing and, and supplying, the, we're, we're cash rolling the project out as well for rural communities because finance is a huge issue as well for rural communities in terms, how do we finance this? How do we uh, provide the bridging finance? So we implore, we avail of social finance ourselves and we provide this rolling finance then for rural communities and help them find as well the matching requirements, the matching funding element. Um, we provide uh, the, the, the building fabric upgrades. So as a social enterprise, we would have employees directly employed um, by ourselves along with um, labor market schemes. So we would have the community services program, we have the community employment scheme, and also we have the rural social scheme as well. So farmers that um, would be working a week on, week off, we have trained uh, those farmers up and they would work with us and they would create an additional revenue uh, for themselves as well off the farm. Again, all of whom are local and would have uh, you know many of the householders uh, that, that they would go out and insulate themselves. So again, there's a comfort uh, in that as well. As we all know, when we're working in rural communities, everyone knows everyone or knows of somebody. So word of mouth is particularly important uh, to us. We provide all of the energy audits as well. So we provide the energy surveys to the householders and also to the SME sectors 
Um, again, I suppose it's important to highlight um, that it's not just domestic householders. We would very much look at schools, um, large multinationals, uh, the community sector, community buildings as well. So we provide all of those energy audits and also look at design solutions as well, because, because the reality is not every building is the same. And buildings that are built prior to 2006 are all el eligible for uh, this funds. So um, we could be looking at uh, buildings that are built in the last 100 years. So again, the design solutions are very, very different to the, in comparison to the time frames that they were built. Um, we look at demonstration projects as well. So I know SEI are very open to different demonstration models and we're very, very much pushing um, innovative designs and innovative solutions as well. And because of our social enterprise too, we have that ethos that we want to share all of this knowledge to the community and invite the communities to come on board and to see it firsthand all the different uh, renewable energy technologies and the most up-to-date re renewable energy technologies that is available out there. And again, to facilitate third party finance, um, this is very, very relevant in terms of SEI's perspective now. And there's an onus on contractors like ourselves in Clor, not only do you go out and provide mentoring servers and capacity building supports, not only do you provide um, the actual works, but also there is an onus on us to help with third party finance. So in the application process to SEI, you very much have to find out and, and, and to help the householder and the community development association or the SME find that matching fund. So whether that's a 30% or 50%. So we would go to the local credit unions, uh, we will go to other private um, institutions, providing a letter, letter of comfort based on the survey and the energy survey that has already been conducted to estimate the savings. So that extra savings there would be able to contribute to the repayment of a, a green energy loan that they may be able to access from the local credit union or perhaps um, uh, the private um, finance institution. And also, um, again, coming back to trust and the relationship of trust and the transfer of knowledge. And that's the whole aspect of the sustainable energy uh, communities approach that SEI are promoting and that we here in Clore are promoting as well. That is the whole transfer of knowledge and to empower rural communities that they too, at some stage, will be able to apply for these funds themselves. This is a graph uh, in terms of the services that we provide uh, in Clore. And as you can see, project management guarantee excellence to people. So we would uh, train our uh, subcontractors. We would very much manage the network of approved subcontractors as well. So we do that scoping exercise, make sure that they're familiar with the technical specification from SAI and um, you know, very much put the subcontractor to make sure that they're, they're, they're fluid themselves and they have the ability and knowledge and that they are registered with SCI in terms of carrying out the contracted works. Uh, we very much strive in creativity and innovation. We work very much in a partnership approach. We look at the whole match funding aspect, the, the, the company philosophy. We very much look at complex projects as well. And when I'm saying complex projects, it's not just on one location. We very much look at the whole uh, geographical community as well and how uh, maybe an SME or a community development organization can become the, the energy champion for that community, bringing on board the wider community as well. We look at how we can replicate projects and how we can deliver and sustainable growth and energy targets. So the whole models of replicating. So that's uh, very much touching on sustainable energy community as well. How we in Clor can replicate um, and provide opportunities for rural communities to become sustainable energy communities as well. And finally, looking at the whole technical and leader and technical and financial leadership as well. As I said, we provide the cash flow if you like in terms of enabling rural communities to participate so um, and we help them um, look at uh, additional funding as well uh, perhaps through through leader and also carry out the surveying as well for domestic householders free of charge we bankroll the projects as well as you know with, with SCI so that's all very I suppose a practical way of how uh, we help create sustainable energy communities 
Uh, finally, um, I'm just going to look at one case study here that we have helped uh, in the last two, two years through the Better Energy Communities. And it's a very innovative uh, project, as you can see there by the, the photographs. And it's Coal Cash Springs um, Group Water Scheme and supplies water to rural properties covering 80 square kilometres stretching from El Finn uh, on Carrick and Shannon uh, right the way down to Balamine eastwards and it's operated by a community cooperative. So uh, through, with the assistance of the Better Energy Community, we installed new solar panels, and um, which was previously drawn from the national grid, and they will now be able to power use in various station, sta stages of the water treatment process. And indeed, that's the first one in Ireland, and I know there's many more to follow as well. So um, we help them operate a contract under Viola, and the project has been backed by Sustainable Energy Authority of a grant of 50%. So they've come on board now for two years with us and have expanded um, you know, for additional solar panels as well. And the remaining energy cost savings enable them um, you know, to become more financing within the next six years that they'll be, um, be self-sufficient, basically. So how do we help? Whole cash, for example, as, as one case study uh, within our, our remit as mentors and within our remit as uh, promoters of the better energy communities. Uh, they were already registered as sustainable energy community, but we worked with them from inception to feasibility. So we helped them gain the planning permission from a common local authority uh, to install uh, the PV and monitoring. I know that Pat Lavin from EcoSmart is also on this call this morning. So um, Pat was very instrumental in assisting Claw ICH and Polcat in terms of working with uh, Roscommon uh, local authority and also using his own expertise as well um, in terms of providing the, the technical backup uh, in supporting this application. And so since the install, we have guided Polcat to the next phase of the project, which will involve the installation of a one megawatt watt PV array. So uh, Polcat Spring Water Scheme is working with Chlor CH, EcoSmart and Viola, and it's the first group water scheme to become uh, renewable energy efficient and to directly power its plant through a renewable energy source. So we're very, very proud of that project. Um, so the site will be able to reduce the energy cost by 70%, will be able to cut carbon emissions and uh, following the launch of new solar panel projects. So the PV system will directly help the environmental environment by reducing CO2 emissions and again enabling and empowering the rural community to, benef to benefit uh, from water treatment cost savings. Um, and again for, for more of those different projects um, please feel free to contact Chlor ICH and we'll be able to share uh, some of our experience um, with you. Alma, sorry to interrupt you, sorry Alma, we're just a little bit over time. Um, no. So just to leave enough time for Karen afterwards, if that's okay. <laughs> so I'm just about to conclude. Um, so the engagement tools, again, how we conclude is through word of mouth, uh, social media, newsletters, energy efficient advice clinics, uh, looking at key members of community aspects and key, key members of SMEs. We identify energy champions, a lot of PR, and again, a lot of hard work as well for, uh, on behalf of our rural communities and ourselves. So again, uh, that's um, the work that we um, deliver in Chlor ICH. Um, I hope that you found that uh, beneficial uh, to you. Um, again, um, I will just introduce you to our next speaker perhaps. Uh, again, if there's any comments that you'd like to make, uh, please feel free to use the chat facility there um, on the platform. So uh, finally, may I introduce you to our final speaker, Karen Arbuckle, and Karen is chair and one of the original founding member board members of Northern Ireland Community Energy Cooperative. And um, the Community Energy Benefit Society was established in 2014, and she first came to be interested in community-owned energy around 2011 and became actively involved in Drumlin Wind Energy Cooperative Limited. So Karen, without further ado, I'd like to hand the floor over to you. Okay, can you see my screen folks? 
Yes, Karen, we can. Yep, we can. Great. Okay. Um, good afternoon, folks. Um, or good morning, actually, I should say. I am currently the chair of Northern Ireland Community Energy, but I've actually been involved in community energy projects now for 10 years. Um, I find it a bit hard to believe, but I was looking back on photographs um, when we first started um, a project here at home. Um, they went back to this time in 2011. So, who am I? Basically, I am a community person. And 11 years ago, uh, here in the farm, we wanted to do something to reduce our energy costs. And we looked into the possibility of um, a wind turbine for the farm. At that time, the cost to us um, was beyond our means. And we approached a bank, uh, a couple of banks actually, and they weren't interested. They just saw it as too risky. So a few months later, after we, we had done a lot of work, um, we just got a cold call out of blue from an entrepreneur called Andrew McMurray. He asked us if we'd be interested in becoming involved in a cooperative um, that was looking to put up wind turbines. And our farm came up as one of the most windy spots uh, in the province. Um, and that's basically how I got involved in community energy. So what are the benefits of community energy? Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, needless to say, there are multiple benefits. Um, the obvious ones are environmental and the economic, but in addition to that is the social and the educational benefits. And both the projects that I'm going to talk to you about today um, demonstrate um, each of these benefits um, that are listed here in the table. So one of the things for me um, in getting involved in the project was making use of our natural resources, which are free, um, they cost nothing. And the technology that we employ uh, to harness that energy uh, is safe and uh, has no impact on the environment. Um, where I live, uh, I have two large KV lines go across my property. Now those KV lines are very necessary to deliver the energy to the province, but they're not, they don't seem to me to be as environmentally friendly as some of these renewable technologies. And that's how I became uh, involved um, because I thought the wind turbines and the solar PV were um, much more environmentally friendly options. So I'm going to talk to you today about two specific models and we went for the cooperative model. And we've heard to from the others, um, you know, what is a community energy uh, society? What is a community energy group? And that's one of the things that we're actually looking at at the minute between um, Drumlin and Nice and some of our other community energy uh, colleagues. What actually is the definition of a community energy group? And there can be various um, um, definitions within that. And we've heard about place and geography. Um, a group of interested people. But one of the things um, a cooperative does is bring together people of like minds and they're united voluntarily together in those aspirations. And they have a specific uh, set of principles that they follow in that um, 
it's democratic member control, one member, one vote. Do we all have an equal say in the running of the business and concern for the community? Um, the Northern Ireland Community Energy, which I'll be talking to you about, was supported by cooperative alternatives uh, to establish. Cooperative Alternatives is the only um, development agency in Northern Ireland um, for expertise and development um, of new cooperatives or community benefit societies. The Drumlin project, um, there was no support at that time. There was no agency available locally and they had to avail of that support, uh, support from uh, an organization called Energy for All in Barrow and Furness. So I'll just explain to you what the differences in the, the two co-ops co are. And I'll start first of all with Drumlin, purely because Drumlin um, was started first. Uh, Drumlin is the first uh, wind energy co-op in Northern Ireland. It has six 250 kilowatt turbine, turbines. Uh, they've been operational now for actually six years and the capital investment needed to um, erect those turbines came from a community share offer and from that community share offer um, there are nine, over 900 members and each of those members um, have a say and um, vote in the running of the business, irrespective of the number of shares that they hold. So whether you hold £250 worth or £20,000 worth, each person has the same say. There are also a number of stakeholders, um, one of which is me as a landowner. Um, I get income from the turbine for the lease of the land. Uh, Energy for All, who uh, provides services to us in terms of managing our membership and other uh, expertise. And the project manager, um, who is the entrepreneur, uh, Andrew McMurray. From the profits of uh, the co-op, those are divided between the stakeholders and an interest payment to the shareholders. And in Drumlin's case, um, the interest payment on average over the 20 year period is 12%, which is extremely, um, extremely good. Um, and you certainly wouldn't get that anywhere at the minute um, that I know of. In, Aside from that as well, we have a community fund. And when it was first started um, back in 2012, we had set aside 2,000 pounds per turbine uh, into the community fund. That has since been uplifted um, to take account of inflation. And that community fund is specifically used for education purposes. And you can see a picture down here of the kids standing around one of the turbines. And I'm going to show you a, a little clip in a minute um, of that education programme, uh, because it has, it's not just about children. The education programme can go right through to any group, um, to any age group. And it's all about getting people an understanding of where their energy comes from and how they can harness it in um, a more environmentally um, friendly way and reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, this picture down here on the bottom is uh, the turbine on my farm. Um, this is our local primary school, uh, a group of P5s that um, have come out uh, to see the turbine and usually an hour's programme, just talking through the kids with um, what the turbine um, is about and um, getting a chance for them to engage with us and ask questions. 
um, about the turbine and how it works. And this is just a quick uh, clip of the education programme that we run. Our turbines use wind energy to produce electricity without harming the environment. Drumlin members are committed to raising awareness of renewable technologies that care more for our planet. We have engaged Peter, an educator, to go into our local schools to make the new generation aware of what's possible. We start by considering climate change, fossil fuels, renewables, wind energy and the design and functions of wind turbines. I demonstrate to the class how magnets and copper wire can be used to produce electromagnetic conduction. The classroom is then transformed into a workshop. Each group is given the task of designing and building a car to support an electric motor and mounting with attached propeller. The children learn so much in the sight of this. They come up with ideas, communicate set goals, think critically, work creatively, evaluate outcomes, and much more. The session is tailored to fit perfectly into the school curriculum, particularly the world around us, and also encourage the development and use of thinking skills and personal capabilities. More importantly, the children enjoy the session, and as they do, they develop skills and dispositions to function effectively in a changing world. Children care. They are inventive and full of ideas. We recognise that future energy needs and the health of the planet will be in their hands. Drumlin Wind Energy Cooperative has shown that local people and communities can and do make a difference. We invite you to get involved. Give us a shout. We can do talks or visits for schools, youth and community groups. We welcome invitations from any interested groups. Join the energy and environment debate now. Contact Drumlin Co-op today. So that's just a very brief clip of the primary school um, program that we run. Um, we've also run a funding for forestry school program, and we've done a number of turbine visits for community, um, for community groups and organisations. And because we have six turbines um, spread throughout the province, those uh, visits have taken place from now. Uh, as far down as Newton Hamilton, and I probably have a map, I think. Yeah, I have a map here of our locations. One of the questions people often ask is why um, do we have the turbines spread? Why are they not um, in a wind farm? And the simple answer is um, the infrastructure in Northern Ireland was such that we couldn't get that type of um, arrangement. Um, these spots were picked um, for a number of reasons. One, because they're windy. Two, because of the grid connection, um, uh, three phase connection, and planning as well was a, a, a significant consideration. So, on to the second. Uh, Co-op. Um, this is a community benefit society, and it slightly different differs uh, from Drumlin in terms of its size and scale. Um, it was established in 2014, and as a community benefit society, the majority of the profit um, for us is to go back to its members and to go back into the community to be reinvested for further projects. So I'll just um, take you through um, the um, conditions of our uh, community benefit society and explain where the differences are between us and Drumlin. So in 2014, um, we came up with, it was a very pioneering, um, model whereby it was called a share your roof scheme, uh, which differs from the other schemes that um, some of the solar PV companies um, were offering at that time. So we were asking our community groups 
to let us use their roof to put our solar panels on. They don't actually own the solar panels, Mike owns the solar panels. But at the end of the 20 year period, um, which is the lifespan of our project, the solar panels will be given to those community organizations and they still will be very viable and um, give them a return. The key thing was that these were free solar PV installations. And to be able to do that, um, we did a community share offer like Drumlin. Uh, we went out to um, the local people and asked them if they wanted to invest in our um, community benefit society. Whereas Drumlin was in the millions of pounds that needed to be raised, um, NICE was a much smaller project in that we needed to raise 150,000 in the first share offer and the second share offer we raised just over 60,000. And that enabled us to do um, facilitate 18 community organisations and install uh, solar PV arrays of a total of 190 kilowatts. Those generally, um, by and large, tend to be 12 kilowatt um, arrays. There's one slightly bigger and a few slightly smaller. One of the conditions of um, our solar PV installations is that we have an asset lock on the solar PV so that if for any reason the community organisation um, failed uh, to continue or had to desist, then we were able, we will be able to lift those um, solar panels and put them on to another community organisation or like-minded organisation. So it's just an inbuilt protection. As I said, the difference um, between the Drumlin model is that um, the return that we give back to our members is much lower. Um, we offer up to 4% return on our investment. And that's so that the surplus profit, the rest of the surplus profit goes into a community fund. And that's going towards further community energy initiatives and also energy efficiency initiatives. The benefit for our participating community organisations is that they get reduced energy bills and it's fairly significant. I think is it 16 and a half pence roughly for um, electricity at the moment. Our organisations are only charged not 0.58 pence. So they're saving a third, um, two thirds. Um, and for those organisations that can be up to a thousand pounds of saving. It's not widely um, uh, huge, but a thousand pounds to these organisations means a lot. And the fact that we have the community fund is enabling us to keep the cycle ongoing so that when we reinvest in another project, then the cycle continues. So the 18 installations, um, this is just a list of the organisations that are participating. And you can see there are a wide range um, from Chinese Welfare Association to um, a community group, um, Ulster Wildlife, um, all um, participating and getting the benefit of the solar PV. So this is just a diagram to explain uh, how community shares work and the cycle uh, of the investment. So the community invests in the project through the community shares. That enables community energy uh, initiatives, so um, various uh, technologies or energy efficiency initiatives. The profit from those projects generates um, income and efficiency savings for those community groups through significantly reduced energy costs. There's also a return to the members and any surplus profit from the project is then rolled over into a community fund and that keeps the cycle going. 
So what is the future for community energy? Um, I was very envious listening to Kiva um, telling us about what's going on in the Republic of Ireland. And at the minute, Drumlin and Nice uh, are working with um, some of our uh, community energy stakeholders um, in Northern Ireland towards um, a community energy policy for Northern Ireland. And it's interesting to see some of the people that we've been talking to um, are participating today. And I hope um, they've taken note of a lot of the enablers that Kiva talked about, because a lot of those enablers is what needed for community energy in Northern Ireland to grow. There only are two community energy co-ops in Northern Ireland. In England, Wales and Scotland, there are hundreds and that's the difference because we haven't had um, the same policy support and enablers in Northern Ireland to be able to grow. Um, and if we are to grow, that needs to change. And if anybody is interested in finding out more about our community energy policy, we would love to hear from you. It's one of the difficulties is getting um, people's uh, motivation and interest in community energy and the realization that there are benefits um, for community in becoming involved. And I think that's not yet recognized. And to be able to change that, we need to have more community energy projects on the ground because seeing is doing. So an energy strategy is vital, but as part of that energy strategy, we need a community energy policy within that. Um, one of the things, uh, as I said before, we were looking at a community energy definition and what community energy actually means. A diverse smart mix of renewable energy. Um, there's no one technology um, that we're wedded to. Wind is probably the most profitable, but solar, um, hydro, wave, all of those in the right locations um, are equally um, need to be part of this mix. Energy efficiency is one of the key things as well. Um, this is community energy is not just about generating energy. And I think we often forget about the efficiency side of things. And ideally what we should what should be should have been done was the energy efficiency should have come first and then the generation. But if we are where we are, um, both things can be done side by side. Um, and to do that, we need to be able to educate and um, provide the mentorship and supports that Kiva was talking about to create those energy efficiencies. So it's not just a case of going in and doing retrofit. That's not the answer. There's more to energy efficiency than retrofit. Um, and that's one of the things that we're very keen uh, to look at and promote. The investment support and enablers, I'm not going to go through. Um, we have uh, put some suggestions to the Department for Economy in terms of the enablers that we think are needed. Uh, in Northern Ireland, and it's around some of those barriers um, that we came across when we were doing um, particularly the wind project, and that was things such as grid connection uh, and planning. And they fell a bit the, the chance to be able to avail of um, finance. Infrastructure also comes within that um, and that's another um, huge area of investment is needed in the grid structure in Northern Ireland. Energy democracy and equitable and fairness. That is, um, we want communities to be empowered. We want them to be properly, uh, properly engaged and communicated with. Um, there's a lot of token, um, gestures made in terms of yes there will be um co-design and communication with communities that's not about 
telling communities or talking to communities and telling them what you're going to do. Proper energy democracy is where the communities actually have a say in their energy and can take um, ownership of their own energy. And that's a significant difference. And that's really what I see co-design as being about. So that citizen engagement and communication is a very key feature or should be a key feature of our energy strategy and community energy policy. And it's not happening properly at the moment. Education and awareness, that's um, simple. It doesn't need to be explained any further. And the last thing is commitment. And that is commitment from us, the members of the community. We need to become engaged in where our, where our energy comes from and how we harness that energy. And to put ourselves forward to have a say in um, how that energy is managed. So finally, um, I'm getting the signal now to finish. Um, this um, is us at a a rally in Belfast um, of like-minded community energy people and climate activists. And all of these things are important um, to show that we can work cooperatively and can achieve community energy or community ownership um, of renewable energy development by engaging and working in partnership with communities, raising awareness of environment and community resilience and sustainability, um, helping to reduce carbon emissions, reduce re utility costs, showcasing carbon technologies, low carbon technologies, but also realizing or helping communities to realize that there's a social uh, and economic and health benefit to community energy. And I think that's me. Thank you, Karen, for that uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I think um, with all the presentations today, they certainly did link in um, stage by stage and they complement each other uh, very nicely um, in our uh, community empowerment uh, webinar this morning. Now, I'm just looking at the uh, chat facility here and I know there's a number of perhaps questions or comments uh, that we might take time out. I know that we're over time, but it's such an important topic as well that we ha all have so many important aspects and um, you know ideas when it comes to empowerment and the empowerment of uh, energy, community energies. But, um, looking at the chat facility um, in terms of definition of communities, and I think that's a kind of a, a very interesting one. Um, perhaps uh, Karen and Quiva. Would you like to um, look at that in terms of how you define communities from, from the outset um, in terms of your own work, Karen, and uh, Quiva in terms of sustainable energy communities, whether it's geographical or communities of interest, or how do you go about that? Sure, yeah, happy to address that. Um, I, I, I thought that in terms of that question, it was likely around the kind of community definition when we talked about community-led projects within RES. Um, so just to state, because we get that question quite a bit in terms of how community-led projects are defined there. So for RES, the definition for that was really followed along the lines of the renewable energy community definition that was within the clean energy package or the renewable energy directive. So essentially that is based on um, open and voluntary participation and it can include individuals and SMEs um, as well as local authorities and then not-for-profits and or local, um, local community organizations. So the primary purpose of the entity has to be to provide um, environmental, economic, societal, or kind of social community benefits for its members or its shareholders, or for the local area that they're with it, that they're operating within, rather than financial profits being, you know, the main driver. And at least one member or shareholder of the group has to be a registered SEC. So that's how that definition stands in relation to, um, to Res. That's great. Okay. Thank you, Quiva. Karen, would you like to add anything to that? 
Yeah, we looked at a number of definitions um, across Europe and um, those that have been uh, implemented in England and Scotland. And we came up with a broad definition um, that we have suggested, which is community energy refers to the delivery of community led renewable energy, energy demand reduction and energy supply projects, whether wholly owned or controlled by the geographical communities and or communities of interest or through partnership with public sector or, com or commercial partners. So we weren't saying that um, public bodies um, were considered to be community, but if they were in partnership with a, a community group, that was acceptable. Okay, uh, that's great. Okay, thanks, Karen. Um, we have another, uh, I suppose, a question here in terms of, from uh, Paulino, in terms of the role of local councils in the Republic of Ireland, if any, to help support SECs and the work of housing associations such as CLOR, ICH. Um, perhaps I can address that one in terms of housing associations and the role, uh, roles of local authorities. Um, yes, we would work as a voluntary housing association with the local authority. Uh, in the development of um, housing in terms of uh, making an application to the department for the actual housing complex in the first place and also establishing housing need and developing that housing need, illustrating that housing need as well to the, the department. Uh, in terms of energy, retro energy retrofitting grants as well, we would carry out a lot of the works on behalf of the local authority. So, for example, Mayo County Council or Common County Council, they will all be a part of our better energy communities and we would deliver those works on their behalf. So, um, for example, uh, that, that's a two-way process as well and very beneficial. Um, I mentioned in my uh, presentation there about EV charges, for example. So they're at the moment now in County Mayo, they're rolling out the whole um, EV uh, charging. So we're able to locate, um, strategically locate those EV chargers and make the application on, on behalf of uh, the local authority to um, SEAI. So there's more holistic approach there. And it's a nice, it's a, it's a, good, a good approach in terms of working in partnership um, with the local authority and with the, the voluntary sector as well. Um, Prebu, would you like to come on board there and just in terms of the role of local authorities in, de in the development of SECs in the Republic? Yeah, I was just going to mention there about, um, it, we've worked with local authorities quite a bit in terms of getting them involved in supporting SECs in a number of different ways, but one of the key ways that they've been supporting them to date is through the energy master plans. So they actually, a lot of our the local authorities are actually acting as the lead applicant on behalf of the SEC to help them to manage the administration of the grant itself and the procurement process in terms of getting the energy master plan consultant on board and helping to provide some funding up front for the SEC and then the local authority can claim back the, the grant retrospectively then from SEAI. So it's just sort of helping to bridge that gap um, for the communities and helping to support them a little bit more in terms of handholding them through the process. And we're also at the moment working with um, the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage and the local authorities in relation to one of the Climate Action Plan actions, um, which involves all local authorities developing a decarbonisation zone within their local authority area. So we're utilizing some guidelines that were developed through within SEI back in 2011 in relation to sustainable energy zones. And they actually informed the creation of the, the SEC program as well. So we're helping to um, update that guide and provide it to local authorities for them in looking to develop their decarbonization zones as well and working with the local SECs in their areas to do that. Okay, thank you, Karen. Um, that's, um, that's one of the key things that's missing in Northern Ireland. Um, there, there is no partnerships with um, local authorities uh, with community energy. Um, one of the things NICE would have liked to have done back in 2015 um, would have been to put solar PV on um, the roofs of community um, or council owned buildings. Unfortunately, um, there wasn't an appetite from councils um, to do that. And since that, um, it has been rolled out across uh, England and Scotland. I've have, um, have actually done a number of projects now. So 
with falling behind in terms of what could have been done here. So that again is another um, enabler um, that we're asking to be um, considered within the Northern Ireland Energy Strategy, um, greater partnership working. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, we are, as taxpayers, um, are funding those bodies. Um, they should be seen to be supporting um, renewable energy technologies, which hopefully would showcase a lot of the work that we would like to be done. Thank you, Karen. Um, I just see a question here and a comment from Polino uh, again in terms of the Republic of Ireland's approach to enabling the development of SECs and active consumers. Has the Irish government and or SEI implemented the minimum requirements under the Clean Energy Package Directives or exceeded those to meet own national strategic objectives or targets? Quiver, would you like to take that one on board? Sure, yeah. Um, Quite a big I mean, question. <laughs> no that's fine um i mean there are obviously minimum requirements that um need to be met as part of as uh, you know given that we are an eu member state through the clean energy package so those requirements will have to be put in place and they are they've been built into ireland's national energy and climate plan so that actually has to go to the european commission for review and sort of agreement and approval so that has been done but irish policy i think has also taken that step further as well in terms of our own direction setting our own targets as well that go kind of beyond the the minimum Minimum requirements and that's largely been set out through our climate action plan and I know I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation that the first draft of that climate action plan was published in 2019 but it's actually being reviewed and revised this year and that's something that's going to happen on quite a continual basis that it will be reviewed and then amended as is needed as time goes on as well so um yeah I think I think we have met those minimum requirements but we're also looking you know to set our own pace as well okay okay Thank you, Kriva. Karen, have you anything to add? I know that um, in your presentation there towards the end, you're perhaps looking at um, energy democracy, which I found very, very interesting. So perhaps in policy, it's not just good enough to have a, a strategy for the rollout of retrofitting, that there needs to be some kind of a, you know, a community strategy as well and how uh, the community decides what way um, you know, their, their energy is used and has that multiplier effect as well and how it works best for them within their own locality. So that's very interesting. I think we need to learn from what has happened across the water. Um, a lot of retrofit was done and done badly. Um, there is no one size fits all for retrofit. Um, there needs to be proper um, assessment and auditing of premises because the fabric of buildings, um, certainly in Northern Ireland is very different. We have new to old, and extremely old. Um, so what will do a stone farmhouse will not be the same as a terrace house in a city. And it doesn't necessarily need to be about retrofit. Um, there are other uh, efficiency measures that should actually maybe be considered first before expensive retrofit um, is brought into vogue. So it's really just about not going down this one size fits all because that's not going to work. Um, it needs to be um, energy efficiency, which is tailored to the individual domestic circumstance or the community organization that, um, that we're working with. And that's part of what we would like to be doing through community energy hubs and um, that would be generating expertise and knowledge within those community hubs so that they would be able to undertake this work themselves. Okay, um, thank you. I am conscious of the time as well. Um, and I know, I think we have done our best in terms to address all of the comments in our chat facility. Um, maybe for the next two or three minutes, we can open it up to the floor and see if there's anyone that would like to pose a question or maybe has a comment um, or something to, you know, to me to add uh, before we wrap up today's webinar. Um, if you, anyone would like to raise their hand there, perhaps, or contribute something uh, to our conversation. Mm -hmm. 
No. Okay. Are you not? Alba, I'd just like to say that obviously there was a range of contributions there. And as you as you rightly said, they, they give a good uh, perspective from different points of view. And I think that that you know certainly I look at what's happening in, in the south of Ireland and think you know we have a lot that we could aspire to to get this more mainstream than it is. Um, you know, but those are those are just my thoughts. And thank you to all the contributors uh, and to all the attendees. I hope that it, it was useful for all of you. Thank you. Una. OK, I, um, I think that's uh, the end of our webinar. I'd like to thank all of you for uh, attending and indeed participating um, in our webinar this morning. Uh, we've certainly heard some very insightful um, advice and views from Karen and Quiva. Um, and I'd like to thank you both uh, for your, your contributions. Um, our seminar about community empowerment um, certainly has posed a lot of questions, if you like, as well, in terms of how do we further empower our communities? How do we further work, work with stakeholders? How do we further enhance our policies to ensure and secure uh, the empowerment of our, our communities going forward, especially as there's more of an emphasis on to meet those targets um, nationally and locally? And how do we enhance um, our communities to avail of all those different opportunities that are available to them. Um, for our presentations, all will be available um, on our website. So uh, please feel free to go onto our website and there'll be uh, frequent updates as well on our tweeting, uh, our tweeting machine that's coordinated by Amy there and also on our Facebook page as well. We also have a newly established uh, YouTube channel as well. So we'll be uploading all of the presentations onto our YouTube channel as well. So uh, once again, thank you all for participating. And uh, on behalf of Handy Heat, I wish you a very pleasant day. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Everyone. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye now. Thank you very much. Okay. Can okay. I so we just have a wee debrief, maybe at quarter past twelve? Does that suit everybody? Yeah, no problem. Speak soon. Okay. Bye. Bye bye.